I'll start again. Uh, we're having a little event here today called Surrealist Reality and Anarchist Dreams. And we're going to have not only Ron Sikolsky, but also uh, Penny Rosemont and uh, Gail Ahrens. And uh, we're going to have a real good time. And all of you who, uh, who may be concerned about what's going on with the Bears game, they are ahead by three with about four minutes to go. So let's have a real good time and uh, long live uh, anarchist dreams. Thank you very much. Hi, we've had a Surrealist group here in Chicago, oh, since about 1968. And we've done a lot of exhibitions and readings and published books. And so it's great to be here at the Heartland where many of our exhibitions have been. We had one, Totems Without Taboos, which was Exquisite Corpses. And I had my own exhibition here of Kite Birds. So uh, usually we were visual, but the whole time we have been publishing books with Black Swan Press and with Charles H. Kerr Publishing Company. And so today we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the things we've published. And Ron Sikolsky, who will be speaking after me, did a book uh, basically on our group called Surrealist Subversions. It was published by Autonomedia Press. We've also done a book called Dancing in the Streets, which was on our early history here uh, in Chicago. It was on Solidarity Bookshop in 1968 and rock and roll and blues. So we also have Paul Guerin in the audience, who is one of our Surrealist group and has written extensively on the blues and is a founding member of Living Blues Magazine. And Beth Guerin, who is a noted surrealist artist and collagist. And Gail Ahrens also, who has put together many surrealist objects and pictures of various sorts. So, uh, I don't even know where to start. We've done so many things. But I did, did want to read a few poems. And I was very pleased to find here at Heartland the Black Scholar edition on Jane Cortez because she was our great friend in New York and we lost her this year. And well, there's no way because I, I thought she was probably the world's greatest poet. So I'm, I'm really sad to have lost Jane. I'm going to read one of her poems. I'm sure I'm not going to do it justice. My favorite poem of hers is called Sacred Trees, but I'm not going to read that one because it's a little long. I'll talk about him. Now this poem is called Go Ahead. Go ahead. Eat the next movie poster. Swallow every signal. Let the moon wax its lips with your chapstick. You have pulp. You have seeds. You have energy. Step up and make yourself know the purpose of looking for another kind of magic. Go ahead. Be romantic. Be ridiculous. Be an airplane that cannot take off if an ostrich is on the runway. And it's never too late to be a spider on the back of a grasshopper. Go ahead, decorate your mouthpiece, and take us there. Now my own poetry is kind of casual. This one was called The Art of Conversation. Her eyes, alphabetically arranged, branch like a chill end to end. Their glances exchange remote divisions of temperature. He holds up a piece of music by Diderot. She ciphers the territory surrounded by the image. At last, their voices bend to the center. From the ends of the earth, dust-like spores of frogs fall very softly. 
did a book called Surrealist Women, and one of my very favorite Surrealist women is Carmen Bruna in Argentina. She's a doctor in a small town and has been an active Surrealist for her entire life. This piece is called Poetry, an Incitement to Revolt. And it relates to anarchy, so I, I thought it was appropriate. You see, the world of La Tremont and Rimbaud is also my world, barbaric and hallucinatory. My poetry is the poetry of the accursed poets. My poetry is truly an incitement to insubordination and revolt. It is the whirling and outpouring of my rebellious spirit, the fever of my blood, my total defiance, and my contempt for academic counterfeits. The fact that the great Latin American poets are not better known in this Republic of Argentina is because of the deplorable but very real lack of interest to poetry in this country. To speak cruelly but truthfully, no yuppie would dare to say he is a poet. And the yuppies in this hungry land, where the unemployed are the great majority, never read poetry. Poetry does not sell. Perhaps that is because true poetry is by definition not for sale. Of course, I defend the myth of woman and have made it my own. Woman, exalted, proud, and irreducible. I have also fought for women's rights on the picket lines, for example, and without foolishness. But I do not believe that women's liberation automatically leads to the most radical of revolutions. Unfortunately, when women occupy positions of political authority, they mimic the mistakes of men. Power always corrupts. And that's why my motto is that of the anarchists, neither God nor master. I continue to believe that women should seize their rights by any and all means at their disposal and enjoy the fullest equality with men. I believe in the harmony of love and sex. And there is a harmony between surrealism and anarchism because at this point, anarchism is the most experimental and open place. So if you want to find new ideas, you have to go to the anarchists to find them. And so, with this, Gail Aaron's ever discovered in these movements is the idea of um, non-work, or the idea that we work too much. I recent, well not that recently, I was at the College of Complexes and I talked about the need to abolish work. And I did not get a very good reception. <laughs> Um, afterwards, people said things to me like, oh, what a complete waste of time Talk about, you know, to talk about not working. How can you say such a thing? I need work to structure my life. They said, don't ever tell the children not to work. <laughs> I, 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 most of the, uh, the surrealists have a term uh, or a word, a term, a meaning called miserabilism. And a lot of this miserableism comes from this work ethic that we have been instilled with in our mainstream, in the realist society. But we live in, but but we in the movement, we live in a surrealist society, and we don't buy that at all. We are, we we like to play, we like to play games, and we we do we all kinds of games. Um, I think one of the more famous one might be the exquisite corpses where you, everybody draws a different portion and you come up with really amazing figures. We, uh, you, we do the same thing with words, so you have word collages and word games. And one of these, Ron came up with one of these games that he's going to be reading for you later of his own rendition of uh, taking a word and replacing it, and he's going to be reading that later. 
So um, I, I guess the main thing I have to say about work is don't work, play. Play more games. And work, we, we view work as a, as a main course when really it should be a condiment to our lives, not a main course. Uh, Penny mentioned the book, Surrealist Subversions, and there were a number of essays in there about the need for working less or abolishing work altogether. Um, Paul Guerin wrote something about um, work should be considered an illness, uh, work, addiction to work, um, obsession with work should be considered an illness. <laughs> I'm all for that. Um, and I'm going to quote something that Penny wrote in, in, a, in an anti-work rant in Surrealist sub Subversions. It is a measure of the depravity of, of the existing form of society that something as detestable as work should provide the substance of so many people's lives and at the same time be officially immune to criticism. We do have private complaining, strikes, sabotages, isolated skirmishes, but to be effective, the struggle to abolish work must become conscious, vocal, public, organized, and international. Um, the mainstream doesn't get along too well with the, this idea. At one point, the Chicago Tribune talked about Lafarge's book, um, The Right to Be Lazy, and called it a dangerous book and dangerous ideas. So um, Lucy Parsons said that we have a society built on wrong principles. And Lucy Parsons, that's another book that has been published uh, by Kerr Publishing. And um, part of the, one of those wrong principles is this whole love affair with work. Uh, Lucy was really involved with um, labor rights. I don't think she talked about abolishing work. But um, she did have very little regard for industrialism, and uh, she didn't think very much of that. So I won't go into my whole 45 minutes anti-work <laughs> spiel here. Um, so I'll close with this. Work now, never, ever. I'm on strike. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I want to pay tribute to, to Don Lacoste in, in that way. Um, there is a connection to what you've been hearing uh, about the Chicago Surrealist Group, of course, and the three books that I've written. Because uh, I've always felt an affinity with the Chicago Surrealist Group uh, from my initial encounters with them in Arsenal and uh, various publications. But that affinity grew and grew as I became involved with the Surrealist Subversions project. And so I started to recognize myself in surrealism more and more. And I think that's the way that it always is with surrealism. It's not that you decide to become a surrealist and are given a set of rules to follow to become one. You recognize yourself in surrealism. And so what that meant was that when I published um, the book that I edited, um, Surrealist Subversions, Writings and Artwork of the Chicago Surrealist Group and, and their Accomplices, uh, that was done as uh, a labor of love and a project that got me involved in starting to write more about surrealism myself. Originally when I pitched the idea of surrealist subversions to a ton of media, that a book collective, and I said, you know, I'd, I'd like to do a book that uh, features the work of the Chicago Surrealist Group, some really juicy tracts that they've written. I envision about a hundred page book of, of, of different writings of the Chicago Surrealist Group. Well, that hundred page book ended up morphing into a 750 page book, and my introduction alone was a hundred pages or more. Uh, so I think that was a nice way of having things mushroom. Um, I come from the Pacific Northwest, which I'll tell you more about later, and mushrooms are, big, are a big part of uh, life down there. Right now, this time of year, there are mushrooms of all kinds in bloom, chanterelles and uh, lobster mushrooms and cauliflower mushrooms, and uh, I, I spend a lot of time in the woods. There are some great um, edible mushrooms and other kinds of more psychedelic ones as well. Uh, I wanted to 
at, at sort of begin by, by talking about these three books that came out of my initial experience with surrealist versions. Uh, the three books form a trilogy in a way that span about 10 years. In 2002, Surrealist Aversions was published, then in 2005, Creating Anarchy, uh, in 2009, Swift Winds, and the most recent book was done last year, Scratching the Tiger's Belly, in 2012. And um, to me, together, they, they kind of have form a, a statement because they're very uh, linked to one another. I don't see my writing as separate, even though they might form different books at different times, different stages. Um, they're all interconnected. And I thought it would be a good idea to uh, maybe, since I have a trilogy, do a little uh, mini book tour and uh, do some readings from the books. And um, what, I, what I realized, though, is that just at that moment that I made the decision to do the tour, one of the books was in danger of going out of print. And that was the book Creating Anarchy. Creating Anarchy was published by Fifth Estate Books. And Fifth Estate is a, uh, well, the longest running anti-authoritarian periodical in North America. So they have put out this magazine for a long time. They were going to do a little experimentation to see if they wanted to actually be a book publisher. And I was their experiment. Uh, they decided that actually, while they liked my book very much, they couldn't really publish any other books. They really weren't set up to be a book publisher. They needed to put all their energy into the magazine. So consequently, that book was in danger of going out of print. And uh, fortunately, Arden Press in uh, Berkeley, California, came to the rescue. They did a reprinted uh, version, really a second edition, has a new cover by Penelope Rosemont, uh, who's here tonight and preceded me, and it also has a few new chapters in it and a new introduction. So consequently, now that that book has come out, which was only a few months ago, I can actually be here and make that tour with books in hand and um, so it's great to be back in the Windy City. And I would like to say a few words, just off the top of my head, kind of things about the connections between anarchy and surrealism, and then I'll do some readings from the books. I guess um, one of the main things that I want to say is, you know, people who come to anarchy or who come to surrealism do it for various reasons and there are various compelling reasons and non-rational emotional connections that people have. For me, what interests me bo most about anarchy and surrealism is their interconnections. I'm interested in that crossroads between the two, the links between the two, the way in which they intersect is what's exciting for me. So that's really what this trilogy is about. There have been many books written about anarchy, many books written about surrealism. These books sort of have that as their focus. In some, some of the pieces in the books, it's very clearly the focus. In others, it's part of a, a puzzle and you can see how it, it might fit in that particular you know, puzzle. And, and so uh, that's where I'm, I'm coming from in terms of both anarchy and surrealism. Uh, so, uh, basically, um, to say a few words about how they interconnect, Bakunin, the anarchist, um, is very famous for his statement, the urge to destroy is a creative urge. And the way that I see it, uh, surrealism has within it both uh, the, the idea of destroying reality or destroying the... Uh, distinction between dream and reality, the artificial dichotomy between the two, and also creating something new, moving towards a world in which people can live more poetic lives. Um, the kind of uh, way in which uh, life can uh, be more of uh, connected to poetic expression. And in some ways that's where Gail is coming from in her rant against work. Work gets in the way of leading a more poetic life as we all know. So uh, that's uh, part of the larger context of where something specifically like um, how we view work might fit in. 
And of course, I'm really only speaking for myself. These are my own ideas on how these things are connected. Um, one of the things that uh, also stands in the way is the idea of miserabilism that Gal mentioned. Miserabilism is not only uh, a system for creating misery, but for the idea that misery is the only possible reality. A surrealist is interested in challenging reality. So in challenging reality, challenging the assumptions that uh, our, our lives are based on, that's pretty deep. It goes to the root of so many things. And that's the connection with, uh, with anarchy. Anarchy also sort of is, seeks that, that upheaval, uh, the idea of demanding the impossible. The impossible only seems impossible be on realistic grounds. If you are interested in unseating reality, then you can move towards the impossible. And so what seemed to be impossible is really not, uh, with, with, is not without possibility. And so it shatters the glass of possibility. And uh, miserableism is what keeps people uh, sort of separated, uh, doesn't allow them to enjoy the collective adventure of mutual aid. And one of the ways that that works is through what I call mutual acquiescence. Uh, people, instead of aiding each other uh, together to move beyond reality, drag each other down into the mire of reality. And I think that's what you were talking about, Gail, about how people view work, that experience you had when you presented the idea of abolishing work. Um, that's, that's mutual acquiescence. It's the exact polar opposite of mutual aid. Mutual aid is a basic anarchist principle. Mutual acquiescence is the way we collude with our own oppression. And so not only is there oppression that's very real, that comes down from above, but we also encourage uh, ourselves to fit into that oppressive mode of being through this idea of mutual acquiescence. Our friends, we surround ourselves with friends that tell us, you know, get with the program, you know, you have to fit in, uh, what's your problem, um, you know, stop whining, all the rest, right? So w what I'm interested in doing is kind of challenging a lot of those assumptions. And in a way, what I'm talking about is, is about the whole concept of refusal. Refusing to accept what most people accept automatically. Uh, I'm in favor of automatic writing, but not automatically accepting oppressive relations. So um, what I'm interested in doing is not something so new, and it's not something just limited to anarchy and surrealism. If you go back to you know, the, a book by Herman Melville called Bartleby the Scrivener, uh, Bartleby the Scrivener will always respond to his boss, and we might broaden that to the bosses of the world with the statement, I'd prefer not to. You know, uh, in other words, if we just refuse, that's the first step. That's the first step to getting beyond where we are, whether it's refusing your boss and all other authority figures or refusing to accept the ground rules that are foisted upon us. And uh, I think that's the way we discover more about who we are. Penelope mentioned Jane Cortez, and she has uh, uh, some great lines in a poem that have always been inspiring to me. Um, Find your own voice and use it. Use your own voice and find it. Find your own voice and use it. Use your own voice and find it. That's almost, you know, those are, those are words to live by, to discover who you are and how you can uh, create something new with others. It's a collective adventure, right? So there are, there are these kinds of um, touchstone phrases that I, you know, that maybe help explain this difficult concept that people seem to have difficulty with of what is surrealism, right? One of the other touchstones for explaining that for me is uh, the uh, jazz musician, poet, and interstellar traveler, Sun Ra. And, um, you know, he has, uh, you know, the, his poetry is now being released in book form after being unavailable for a long time. And one of the things he said that, that I really like and uh, we have a free jazz musician here tonight, uh, a vocalist by the name of Carol Gennetti. One of the things that um, I really liked that Sun Ra said was, um, 
uh, what is it? Uh, I had it a moment ago. Um, yeah, just a second. Oh yeah, here it is. I don't have to look at that. He said, you have wings, use them. Now that's a pretty profound thing to say in a way. You have wings, use them. In order to use them, in other words, you have to first realize you have them. And I think one of the things that surrealism allows you to do and that anarchy allows uh, one to, to enact, um, you know, there's, a, there's a, uh, an idea and a practice, is going beyond what's accepted uh, as within the idea of human nature, uh, the idea of what humans can do. Uh, you know, everyone knows humans can't fly. But to say, you know, beyond that, to sort of make this metaphor of you have wings, use them, gives you this sense that anything is possible. That the idea that certain things are not possible, uh, that confine you, uh, is something that has to be challenged. And so surrealists are not just simply interested in uh, creating bigger cages for our confinement. They're interested in going way beyond that. You know, the idea of absolute uh, divergence, Fourier's idea. You know, the idea of a challenging, you know, everything, uh, taking your desires for reality. These are all uh, important ideas that connect with surrealism and with anarchy, I would say. And uh, the other, the other uh, sort of catch words and, or watch words that I, I'd like to mention, and then I'll begin my reading, um, is um, there's a, a woman who was uh, a photographer, surrealist, um, lesbian gender bender uh, by the name of Claude Cahun. And uh, she uh, was also a resistance fighter against the Nazis in World War II. She said, um, what was it she said? Um, <laughs> once again, I kind of have to refer here. Oh, yeah. Open up and someone will knock. <laughs> right? Open up and someone will knock. That's, that's sort of, open, you open yourself to what, what, what can happen, right? And something will. And then you can figure out what to do with that and how that might take you to the next level. So for me, those are the kinds of things that motivate my idea of what anarchy and surrealism is all about. Okay, well, uh, I used to live in the state of Illinois. Um, I uh, lived in Springfield, outside of Springfield, in a little town called Pawnee, Illinois, um, which uh, is uh, now very, uh, well, it's a very uh, different kind of place than I live in now. I live in British Columbia in the northwestern part of Canada. And so uh, British Columbia is something, uh, is a place that I think requires a little explanation before I get into this piece that I'll read you about cougars. Um, yeah, British Columbia, it's, uh, some of you have been there, <laughs> at least one of you has been there. Um, Brit British Columbia is something that fits into the surrealist map in a funny way. Uh, there is, a map that most people think of when they think of Canada, and it's not the surrealist map of the world, although there is such a thing, which I'm about to get to. It's the weather map. People, you know, are used to seeing Canada on the weather map as the source of the cold winds that come down to uh, make the Windy City windy and lots of other places in the United States. So Canada has this, you get virtually no news about Canada in the United States except uh, the, the evil winds and the evil tar sands, both, both of which need to be addressed, of course. Um, but for me, uh, I refer back to the surrealist map of the world. Now, on the surrealist map of the world, which was uh, done uh, in 1929, it's actually a visual piece that appears in Creating Anarchy, along with an article I wrote called Reimagining Canada. And it also appears in Surrealist Versions in an article uh, that was written uh, by David Rodinger uh, about the Surrealist map. And on that map, 
uh, the entire mainland of Canada has been absorbed by Labrador. Okay? Now, bear with me for a second. There are islands on the west coast of Canada. Everything else is Labrador, but the islands on the west coast of Canada are called, they may, they've become one archipelago and they, they're called the Queen Charlotte Islands which is the name of the largest one of those islands. But the little island I live in, on, in, uh, which is called Demon Island, would be one of those islands. So I'm included in the surrealist map of the world, whereas the rest of Canada has been absorbed by Labrador or uh, by the Queen Charlotte Islands. Uh, and one of the things that that map does is magically uh, turn Canada back to native sovereignty. Because those places, Labrador and the Queen Charlotte Islands, were not chosen at random. Labrador is the home of the Inuit people. And especially in 1929, it was largely Inuit. And the Queen Charlotte Islands uh, is the Haida people. Now, surrealists had an affinity with the artwork, cultural mythology, connections between dream and reality that the Haida and the Inuit made. And uh, they were very much, uh, you know, enamored with that. And that's one of the reasons that map exists. So the rest of the Europeanized, colonialized version of Canada has ceased to be, and it's been returned to indigenous sovereignty. So that's one way of understanding how surrealism works in allowing you to challenge um, assumptions, right? Now, the little I island that I live on, uh, which is called Demon Island, is um, really its, its indigenous name, as long as we're on the subject, is Sladaish, which means simply inner island. And so since I've been there, I've been able to put together something uh, called, that, that we call the inner island surrealist group. And we love the double entendre of what inner island means, right? So uh, for, for us, that, that works really well. And um, in terms of uh, that, that island, it's much, again, it's a challenge to colonialism to point out that the Pentlatch name is Sladaish, because Denman, who the island was named after and what appears on the map that isn't the surrealist map, is Denman Island, uh, he was essentially um, a British admiral. And when the, the Brits found coal along the Gulf Island coasts, particularly in Nanaimo, and all the way up through Cumberland, they said, uh, well, um, let's send our gunboats out, point them at those people, and steal everything we can. And that's the history of the Gulf Islands where I live. So by challenging that, by refusing the colonial name, uh, I think that's another way in which we can refuse things. Anyway, the island I live on, and, and we'll, we'll now go to the readings. Uh, this is all like an elaborate prelude. It's like my short introduction to surrealist versions that turned into 100 pages. <laughs> and besides, it's more boring. It's, it's not as, you know, you can only take so much of people reading to you, right? And you, want, you want a little explanation, I assume. Anyway, um, it's an island that uh, is still connected to wilderness. So we occasionally get cougars that swim over from Vancouver Island. And those cougars, those wildcats, are very much a part of our lives in the sense that even though they're not always there, we know that our domesticated lives can be interrupted by this burst of wildness, which most people don't have access to in other parts of the world, or certainly in other parts of Canada, right? Or the United States. By the way, the United States in the surrealist map of the world it has been wiped off the map entirely. It doesn't exist. Um, uh, that's another story. David Rodiger wrote about that. <laughs> anyway, um, so the, these cougars will occasionally come out. Now, uh, there are some people on the islands, though, who are very concerned when a cougar comes along and frightened even. Somehow it disturbs the domestic tranquility that they're used to. They don't welcome the visits of cougars. And to me, that's kind of the opposite place that I come from. I, I, I want that domesticity to be intruded upon. And um, I don't view cougars as the problem. In fact, one of the reasons cougars swim out from Vancouver Island to our little island of Sladaish is because developers are gobbling up all their habitat. 
okay, and rapidly. And so uh, they're looking for another place to live. Sladaish, where I live, is a wonderful place if you're a cougar because there are lots of deer and uh, no other predators. So they can actually smell them. It's about uh, five miles from Vancouver Island and they can smell the deer and they'll come out, right? So to me, I'm much more concerned about voracious developers than I am about voracious cougars. You know, they're, they're, the, they're what I'm really uh, opposed to and what I think we should be warned against, right? Thank you. <laughs> anyway, I've, I've kind of done a lot of things in relation to the development and sort of fighting development on the island. One of them is this little piece that uh, Gail alluded to. Every time a, uh, a cougar swims out to Denman, you, we have a, a local weekly uh, newsletter, and they usually reprint this warning about what to do when you see a cougar, you know, because this is this event that is a very scary event for some people. Not that cougars aren't to be respected, but um, what I decided after reading this for the fifth time in the local newsletter, uh, I all of a sudden sort of in reading it realized that it would be so simple just to substitute the word developer for the word cougar and see what happens. I, I didn't really know what would happen, but I thought I would try. It's kind of a detourment uh, thing. So I'll do that. Okay, so I should point out that every word that I'll read you is exactly verbatim except one. Wherever the word cougar appears, I've substituted the word developer. And originally the piece is called um, cougar safety, right? So I call it developer safety. If you meet a developer, never approach a developer. Although developers will normally avoid a confrontation, all developers are unpredictable. <laughs> developers feeding on a kill may be dangerous. Talk to the developer in a confident voice. Pick all children up off the ground immediately. Their rapid movements might provoke an attack. Do not run. Try to back away slowly. <laughs> Sudden movement or flight may trigger an instinctive attack. Do not turn your back. Face the developer and remain upright. Do all you can to enlarge your image. Pick up sticks or branches and wave them about. If a developer behaves aggressively, Arm yourself with a large stick. <laughs> Throw rocks. Speak loudly and firmly. <laughs> Convince the developer that you are a threat. <laughs> Not prey. <laughs> if attacked, fight back. All right, so uh, let that be a lesson to you. All right, I, I think I'm going to read, I'm trying to read you something from each of these books so that um, you'll get a sense of the connections between the different pieces in the books. And. I'll read you uh, something, though, first from Swift Winds, which is the book I just read from. This is a book that's uh, published, it's a pocket-sized book, right? <laughs> it's kind of a little harder these days with skinny leg jeans and all that, and sort of spandex, but the idea is that it's a pocket-sized book. Anyway, uh, it's printed in uh, the northwestern part of the U.S. in Portland, Oregon. 
by a fellow by the name of Charles, who is totally old school, uses offset printing, and uh, does wonderful work, uh, and keeps the prices of the books low so they can get in people's hands. And uh, yeah, so I thought I'd do this little manifesto that I wrote. Uh, it's called The Demanding the Impossible Manifesto. And I, if you've never written a manifesto, I really encourage you to write a manifesto. Uh, lots of fun. You can use all the purple prose that your English teacher told you were, were inappropriate. You can, you know, rant and rave. Um, manifestos are good fun in that way. And I say this every time I read it, right? So I'm beginning to think I should write a manifesto called, you need to write a manifesto manifesto. It's kind of what I, <laughs> what I just did, right? Okay. So. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to read this is because I wanted to celebrate the birthday of Arthur Rimbaud, which it's, it's his birthday today. And thank you for Arthur Rimbaud. He uh, wrote uh, in 1871, when but a, a youth, he wrote uh, this, this epigram that goes with the demanding the impossible anarcho-surrealist manifesto that I included in the book as a prelude. So I'll, I'll begin by reading it. What I did was I tried to take this, this it's a pretty well-known piece from Rambo, and incorporate it into the manifesto so that it shows up in a, a flourish towards the end. Anyway, I'll begin with the epigram from Rambo. I is an other. So what if a piece of wood discovers it is a violin? If brass wakes as a bugle, it's not its fault at all. By demanding the impossible, we become impossible in our demands. Make no mistake about it. We demand an end to all forms of domination and insist on the realization of poetry in everyday life. Only by erasing the artificial dichotomy between dream and reality, can we sever the ties that bind revolutionary demands to a miserablest search for the best of all possible rulers? What is more humiliating than to be ruled? What is more beautiful to a surrealist than the shattered glass of reality? All power to the insurgent imagination. The unfolding of the black flag of anarchy augurs all the wonders that can be created when subservience dies and the impossible is unleashed. What is more debilitating than to follow orders? What is more inspiring to an anarchist than the refusal to obey? Mutiny is a collective form of refusal in which the intensity of the fevered desire for liberty breaks the authoritarian chains of duty and coercion in the convulsive heat of mutual aid. Impatient to emancipate ourselves as soon as the uncharted land of our dreams is in sight, we don't petition the captain to take us ashore, we simply jump ship. Swimming to shore, we are swiftly carried along by the billowing waves of the social revolution. The splendid winds of change blowing at gale force as if in harmony with the intensity of our desires even cause the brass ornaments on deck to reverberate wildly in a jamboree bugle call of marvelous freedom. Looking back, we see the floundering ship of state from which we have only narrowly escaped with our lives suddenly hit a hidden reef and explode into a shower of debris. In awe, we watch the flying splinters of wood transform themselves as if by alchemy into a thousand screaming violins. In spontaneous freedom, they improvise with the aeolian harp sound of the wind, the ocean's leonine roar, and the seagull's incessant cries, 
all vibrating together in the surreal key of anarchy. Reality is no obstacle now, as the impossible looms before us on the horizon like the purple aura that circles the moon in a subversive halo of mad love. We dance all night on the beach in sweaty abandon, swim naked in the coolness of the moonlight, then fall asleep in each other's arms, dreaming of anarchy and surrealism, the impossible compass points of a world turned upside down. Yeah, that was uh, written for the anarcho-surrealist jamboree that happened in uh, Vancouver. There was actually such a thing in 2006. Yeah, I need my little matchbook here because I have my <laughs> page numbers written down here. Thanks to the Ethiopian diamond. And also thanks to Heartland, by the way. I want to thank uh, Michael and Katie for making this possible. And also Penelope. So this is, uh, it's great to be here. And uh, it's great to have this uh, recorded for posterity. <laughs> so thank you. Okay. Okay, I want to go back to a lighter note here, but not, nothing's ever entirely light. This is from Creating Anarchy, uh, the first of the trilogy. And uh, this has a history as well, so I'll, I'll give you a little context before I get, begin. I know we're very far from May Day right now, it being October and all, but I won't be around here this May Day, so I thought I'd read you these surrealist May Day greetings a little early and, you know, keep them in reserve until May Day rolls around. Um, one of the reasons uh, I want to, um, to read this piece is partly uh, in connection with one of my first direct contacts with the Chicago Surrealist Group was uh, meeting Franklin Rosemont at a May Day parade. And so May Day has always had a special place in my heart for lots of reasons, that's one of them. Um, another uh, connection I have for uh, May Day is this, this wonderful May Day celebration happens in Minneapolis. And uh, they, the Heart of the Beast Puppet Theater puts it on. And they have a whole day of May Day celebration, a, a massive parade that's very participatory, people join in. It's one of the best parties in the Midwest. I really would suggest anybody go up there. Um, there's a, a pageant that happens afterwards, and then things sort of filter out into Powderhorn Park, and people hang out, and uh, bands play, and it's, it's really very sweet, totally free. Um, it's, if you can imagine, you know, as you can imagine, um, Minnesota is very glad when, when May comes and the sun finally arrives. So they have some folks who are the sun runners, who um, they are actually in a boat on an island off of where the pageant happens, and people are sitting on the hillside cheering them to come, and they, people go, sun, sun. And this, we're talking about thousands of people doing this. I mean, literally thousands of people come to this. But what I, what I was drawing on here is not just my connection to that celebration, but to the fact that it permeates out into the community for the entire day so that you'll meet people on the street uh, on May Day in Minneapolis who will greet you by saying, Happy May Day, just matter-of-factly. You know, people don't do that. They say Merry Christmas in most places or some other such, you know, uh, holiday, but, you know, they don't really celebrate May Day in that same matter-of-fact way. So I like the idea of um, a May Day greeting, but I thought, what would happen if I surrealized the May Day greeting? And then I got inspired by... Um, Ricky Ducournay, who in the Fan Makers Inquisition um, has something of a, you know, a, a kind of a, a May Day greeting that I thought, yeah, I could play with that and, and do something more. Um, so uh, here are the surrealist May Day greetings. A day devoted to the memory of life before wage slavery. An entire month devoted to dreaming of orcas, a festival 
in honor of the phallus and the clitoris, of the orgasm, the opening of an academy devoted to the erogenous zones, a day set aside for the public mourning of life's errors and the great mistakes of the 20th century. Lots of them, right? <laughs> a day devoted to international forums on masturbation, a month to honor habanero peppers, stinging nettles, ginger tea, and Belgian beer, an early spring devoted to the cultivation of the impossible, an entire century to condemn the WTO, World Bank, IMF, the Bastille, and the hangman's noose, a decade devoted to the erotic arts, a day to melt cannons down into wine goblets, water pipes, and cowbells, a wild month of midnight balls, hot fiddles, sawdust dance floors, free jazz and freestyle rap poetry, a day of rest to welcome the herring run, another devoted to oyster catcher mating rituals, Still another to celebrate the hoodoo magic of winged frogs and the tree frog radio insurrection. And a lifetime to honor the slain Haymarket martyrs whose death in 1886 did not stifle the bright fire of anarchy that burned brilliantly in their eyes. Alive, awake, aflame, we are united in mad love. Happy May Day. <laughs> yeah, I, I, should, I should probably explain, I should have done it first, but I'll do it now, some of the references there. The herring run, uh, for example, you might not, you might be thinking of herring in a very mundane way, but on the island where I live, the herring run is a major big deal because the entire island sea, the sea around the island gets transformed from this dark, murky blue to Caribbean blue by the sperm of the herring that are unleashed by this massive amount of herring that come to fertilize the eggs. So, and all the herring row that appears everywhere. And with all the herring row, with all the herring, all the birds that appear. There's an eagle in every tree. Uh, you know, every conceivable seabird is there in force. And, you know, it has uh, no date. So I can't tell you what day to come there. It happens in March whenever the herring are ready <laughs> to make their move. So that most tourists who come to that part of the world that I live in, uh, they come in the summer because it's not raining so much and it's, you're guaranteed more of sunny weather. And they, they miss the best event of all, which is the herring run. So uh, yeah, I wanted to sort of, I guess, what did I say there about the herring run? A day of rest to welcome the herring run. Um, the uh, other thing that probably needs mentioning too is the tree frog radio insurrection. Uh, one of the things about Dem uh, the island that I live on, Demen or Tzladaish as we prefer, is uh, that it hosts a pirate radio station called Tree Frog Radio. And I have initially, uh, I got my experience with pirate radio here in Illinois, uh, in uh, Springfield, Illinois with uh, Human Rights Radio. It actually started as uh, Zoom Black Magic Liberation Radio. It became Black Liberation Radio, and then uh, finally Human Rights Radio. And when I arrived on Sladaish, people asked me, as they do to newcomers, um, so what do, you, what do you bring to us? <laughs> and I said, well, um, you know, this, this island seems to need a pirate radio station. And, uh, you know, we've had it now for the last eight years. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a lawless place, right? There are no cops on the island. Now, here we are in the year 2013, and there's a place, I want to let you know that there's a place where there are no cops. You know, there are a thousand people who live there. There are no cops, right? <laughs> okay. So, you know, that's really important uh, for lots of reasons. But for surrealist reasons and anarchist reasons, I think it's really important because... Um, Legality is not linked to possibility for people who live on the island I live on. Because they know it's possible to do a radio station even though it's illegal. The island close to us uh, that does have cops, 
decided they wanted to do uh, a licensed community radio station. They started organizing for that station shortly after I arrived, and they finally achieved it um, 10 years later. In our case, uh, you know, direct action gets the goods. We decided we wanted to do a radio station, and six months later we were on the air. So it's literally Tree Frog Radio, the antenna is perched in a tree. Uh, there's nobody here, right, from the FCC, but it doesn't matter anyway, because the CRTC is what, what does it in Canada, not the FCC. So as long as there are no Canadian spies from the CRTC, I, I can safely say that. Um, so yeah, it's a very, uh, very important part of this uh, poem. And the other thing is the oyster catcher. Uh, I do uh, a zine called The Oyster Catcher, which is now in its 10th issue. And it's named after this seabird that you find in lots of places throughout the world. Uh, one of the interesting things about it is it's very queer mating habits. And uh, it's very unusual ways of not only having sex, but also um, relationships between the birds that involve care of the young and so on. Um, there's lots of reasons to love oyster catchers, but that's initially why I decided to name uh, this uh, uh, zine the oyster catcher. And so I think I refer to it here as uh, another day devoted to oyster catcher mating rituals. All of these things about challenging the idea of possibility and moving uh, with the, I'll take any day off from work that they give you, but that's the way they sort of sold this idea to people. And um, there they are, you know, out in the streets, you know, parading, no longer for May Day, but for Empire Day. So I thought, you know, there's something wrong with this idea. So some of us in the Inner Island Surrealist group decided that we'd do a few things in relation to that. One of them is um, we decided we'd join, uh, you know, sort of walk alongside the parade, and we made up these fortune cookies. And let me tell you, it's hard to actually take the fortunes out of fortune cookies and put new ones in, but <laughs> it helps to be stoned. But, you know, we, we did that one night, and, uh, you know, that the fortunes we had in there were... Um, Replace dreams of empire with the empire of dreams. That was one. Uh, the other fortune we had in there was, um, what was it? We love parades, we hate empire. <laughs> so yeah, we, uh, we didn't want to rain on anybody's parade, but we wanted to challenge this whole imperial mindset, right? Now, it, I, we were... <laughs> Ha, <laughs> ha,